But it's really an arrangement where you try to find people a chance to live with other people rather than being in a conventional residential service. And uh, those kinds of options are called, sometimes called home sharing or life sharing uh, or shared living. Uh, there are many different names uh, 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 that they're called. Are, uh, have the advantage, if done well, of keeping life fairly normal for people. They're not really in a service. They're living with people that they might not have known before. Uh, and that has its issues, as you could imagine. But at the same time, they're not in a formal service. But many of those homes are, uh, and those arrangements are created by services. So in a sense, the services are still present in people's life uh, and uh, are responsible for those living arrangements because they help put them together. They monitor them. They get funded. Uh, many of the people that do share homes with people get some kind of funding to do that. So in many ways, they are a service but it doesn't quite feel like a conventional service. This is the challenge with these uh, home sharing or shared living kinds of arrangements is to define what is quality and then to achieve it uh, for people. Now, uh, there are uh, wonderful stories uh, and examples of people that have achieved a huge deal uh, great deal in people's uh, lives. And, and so the arrangement's very fruitful and it's also, for that reason, important to focus on what made it that way. What was it that you know we stimulated or set it up properly so that that could happen? Uh, for instance, a good example was one I found in New Zealand of a, a mother that uh, essentially got some funding to support her son to get a home of his own uh, but the arrangement that she put together wasn't put together by an agency, but by her. And it's, again, a little bit different because it didn't feel like an agency. It was just her sort of doing it off the, off the corner of uh, her desk, as they say. But she thought, well, my son has never lived on his own. He, uh, and what he really needs is to have his normal life as a young man as possible. And she organized to find a couple of housemates for him, and the deal was that they uh, share a home, uh, but also they share their lives with her son and help him to meet lots of people and to be out there in the community doing the things that young people do. And uh, at first she was very nervous, you know, is this gonna work and so on. But the, she picked well, the two young men that she picked, uh, 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 you know, did exactly that. And uh, she began to notice that, you know, she's spending less and less time at the, her son's house because he's so busy with his life and she's with hers that, and everything's going so well that uh, you know, it was almost like worry-free at a certain point and it worked, seemed to work for the young uh, people in general, the two young people that were sharing the house and also worked for him. And they were getting either a bit of money for doing that or a discounted rent or something like that. So it wasn't that there wasn't money present, but the money didn't seem to kind of interfere with the bigger purposes. It was facilitative of it and made the arrangement uh, uh, practical. And uh, of course, you know, he, uh, this young man that w did have the disability, in a sense, got a life, but also got a life that suits a young person. You know, and if he, he went to live with a, an older couple, you know, uh, you know, where would all the young life kind of stuff be? So a lot of the rightness of the arrangement arises from who the person is, what they need, where they are in life, uh, and where they aren't in life. And in his case, he needed more uh, companionship with young people. He got it. He got uh, experiences and uh, connections and opportunities. So it was a very fruitful arrangement. So again, the, what is it that is trying to be achieved from a quality point of view ends up being pretty central to whether the arrangement uh, you know, kind of bears fruit. The, the, that model uh, can uh, be done well, but can also be done poorly. If you look at the kinds of examples of uh, people who become essentially, uh, in some cases, the income for the household, that because they take someone in to live with them, they get an income from that, 
And in some places, the, the, you're, if you do that, you also get tax benefits uh, because the money that you get is not taxed. So they, uh, if people do it for the right reason, those benefits probably aren't uh, the end of the world, but they could also be a perverse incentive uh, with some people. Similarly, if you add a greater numbers of people, you get more money coming into the household. And so there would be instances where some of these arrangements have been uh, uh, limited by governments because they're saying uh, it's only going to be one person per household. Otherwise, we're creating a little mini industry here of uh, taking people in. Um, and it isn't necessarily the case that the individual gets to choose and select who it's, uh, they're going to live with. They, in fact, may at times uh, simply be offered that as the only thing on offer at a given moment. So in, a, in that sense, it sort of violates the principle of people being able to choose freely who they want to live with and, of course, uh, you know, to cease the arrangement if they're not happy with it. So when the arrangement is one which people get along very well and it was fortuitous, uh, then it can be a very good arrangement uh, for people. And many people will have said uh, that uh, great benefits have come to them, uh, as well as uh, that they uh, have, in many cases, had relationships that have gone on a very long time uh, because the people like being together. And it's a kind of, you know, it's not like any either side's being forced into the living arrangement. It's almost like they found uh, the companionship, uh, both uh, the individual with the disability and others uh, found the companionship, uh, uh, you know, uh, desirable. So uh, I think the issue, the challenge for these arrangements is to make sure that the interests of the individual with the disability uh, are prominent, if not uh, dominant, but at the same time not to, uh, uh, to make the relationships voluntary rather than compulsory. Uh, and to uh, spend a great deal of time thinking about matching uh, people and to make sure that, you know, people are, uh, you know, living with people that they, they get on with uh, well. And that's, of course, hard to know. Sometimes you have to just try it to see whether people can get along. But if you can uh, uh, do a little bit of preparation by way of matching well, you might uh, ease some of those kind of difficulties. And so... Uh, uh, the other thing would be, uh, you know, the uh, people might have a place to live, they might, it might be congenial and so on, but it doesn't mean they get a life. It may simply mean they, they get a place to live. And again, that may itself not be per se a bad thing, but it also raises the question of are they, is the job done when they simply have a place to live, or is there some obligation somewhere for people to get some help with their lives and doing things with their lives. And it may not come in many schemes. There may be no provision for that because essentially it's just about getting a place to live. It's not about getting a life. Uh, and in many cases it may not even be about getting a home of one's own uh, because you may be actually moving into someone else's home and it may not really feel like a home of one's own. But there have been instances where people come to your home and home share with you there. Uh, so in that sense, the person with the disability, it is their home. And they can, you know, uh, kind of welcome people or not, as the case may be. So you can see there can be a lot of variation in how these uh, things uh, get set up. And uh, the agendas uh, uh, in some jurisdictions, the one I know very well, the, the criticism was that people were being placed into these arrangements because it was cheaper than other paid accommodation. And so in the name of, oh, you'll like this, the real uh, driver wasn't the well-being of the person necessarily, but rather that they, they would save money uh, by doing this. And uh, so uh, this is where you've got to look at whose needs are met by these arrangements uh, and uh, what's sort of driving them. Uh, for instance, there would be uh, people that uh, really are looking forward to welcoming people into their life and you know sharing their home and sharing their uh, world and uh, are uh, you know you know quite authentic about it and other people that clearly um, spend very little time with the person 
Uh, and uh, remember one a man uh, I met one time, he was uh, living in the basement uh, of the home and he wasn't really welcome in the rest of the house. Um, so, you know, he was providing income for the person whose home it was, but not, uh, you know, the person wasn't really interested in them, and uh, at least uh, in terms of spending a lot of time with them. So the person was getting into difficulty because they had all kinds of time on their own, on their hands, they were lonely, they are going out into the community, getting into difficulties, and so on. So, you know, you'd, you'd most sensible people would question an arrangement like that. Is this really working for people? Even though the person did nothing wrong to the person, they simply didn't do very much uh, for them. So uh, this is the challenge with these uh, home sharing or shared living kinds of arrangements is to define what is quality and then to achieve it uh, for people. Mm -hmm.